top Democrats vying for the party's presidential nomination are pushing to eliminate the so-called right-to-work laws in several states. Legislation proposed by Senator Bernie Sanders and co-sponsored by at least four candidates would make it easier for workers to form unions. It also requires companies to start negotiations within 10 days of organizing. According to author and former labor reporter Stephen Greenhouse, relentless attacks on labor unions have gained ground because over the years, many Americans were disdainful of those organizations, but lack of participation is also partly responsible for the massive rise of in income inequality in the U.S. Joining us via Skype to expand on all of this is Stephen Greenhouse. He spent more than 19 years covering the workforce for the New York Times. He's also author of Beaten Down, Worked Up, The Past, Present, and Future of American Labor. Stephen, it is so great to have you. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Great to be here. So I believe that the attack on organized labor, the decline of union participation, is one of the most important and undercovered trends, really, uh, of our generation. Situate that decline in our current context, and what has it meant for the moment that we're living in now? In my new book, I explain that you know, organized labor and the power of workers generally in the United States has declined to its low, lowest level probably since World War II. Part of that is that you know, the percentage of workers in unions is less than one third of what it had been. And I believe that has contributed to you know, decades of wage stagnation, to income inequality soaring to its highest level since the 1920s, since almost a century. And I also believe that the weakening of labor unions and worker power has created a system where corporate America and the wealthiest Americans have undue sway over our electoral system, over our political system and policy making. Mm -hmm. Stephen, well, I mean, the, I think the problem here is that the unions aren't entirely blameless, is that part of the reason that they were able to be demonized is there was a lot of problem with corruption and early in the beginning, and I think that workers' rights are very important. How, how do you think that the unions have been able to balance this? Because they seem to have uh, had a bit of a resurgence under the Trump administration. So there are many reasons why uh, the number of workers, percentage of workers in unions have declined. Part of it was, you know, globalization, which really hurt manufacturing. We lost six million manufacturing jobs. That was the base of labor. Uh, I also believe a, a very important reason that uh, unions have grown weaker is that corporate America fights against unions, fights to beat back and even quash unions far more than corporations in any other country. And yes, you're right. Uh, unions had shot themselves in the foot in many ways. There was too much corruption. They uh, weren't, uh, they discriminated too often against women and workers of color. But I think that's largely changed and they're really trying to reinvigorate themselves. And we've seen that with things like the teachers, the retro teacher strikes last year, which really showed uh, workers flexing their muscles. And also uh, unions really got huge popular support community support last year with the retro red strikes. And I think that helped make people believe that hey, unions aren't such a bad thing. They could fight to make for better schools. They could fight you know, to uh, bring more, you know, reduce class sizes. And the unions now are the most popular, have the highest approval ratings that they've had uh, in 15 years. 62% of Americans say they approve of labor unions. Huh. That is fascinating. I mean, look, Republicans have attacked unions for a long time. Certainly Reagan, who had been the president of his own union, which is remarkable, but he was really, you know, aggressive going against the unions. Um, but I sort of think that it may have been Democrats realigning themselves with this rising white collar professional elite. And while they still paid lip service to union members and labor organizing, they didn't fight for them the way that they could have. I mean, do you see that as part of the story and part of the decline here? Yes, I, I think you make a good point, Crystal. You know, Republicans have been very anti-union in recent decades. The Democrats are torn whether they want to be the class of professionals, of, of uh, lawyers, of software engineers, of Hollywood folks, of, of Wall Street investors, or whether they still want to be a uh, you know, union for blue-collar workers, and they're torn. And I think one of the problems when Hillary Clinton ran in 2016 was she didn't send a strong message to blue collar workers that I'm going to fight for you. And I think many workers identified her with Wall Street or the Hollywood elite. And I think that's one of the reasons that Donald Trump was able to sneak in and kind of uh, pull an inside straight in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and, and win those states. One point I make in my book is 
so you know we all know about Scott Walker and Republicans in Wisconsin kind of declaring war against the public se sector unions in that state, and and the the new laws passed in Wisconsin basically eviscerate gut the teachers unions and other public sector unions. So in the past decade, uh, Wisconsin's unions have lost 166,000 members, and many of us forget that. Um, Donald Trump won Wisconsin by just 22,000 members. So I often think if union membership hadn't sunk so so deeply, so profoundly in Wisconsin, very possibly uh, Hillary Clinton would have won Wisconsin. And the story is very similar in Michigan. Uh, Trump won Michigan by 11,000 votes, and union membership in Michigan has dropped by almost 200,000 in the past 10 years, largely because of the decline in, in employment in the auto industry. That's and also the past... Point. Well, yeah. Such a great that's, point. That's very interesting, Stephen. And that actually leads to my next question, which is, how are the politics realigning on this? You see a lot of the GOP, and particularly President Trump, casting himself as the friend of workers, not necessarily with unions, but receiving quite a bit of union support and even some endorsement in these states. How is it that the Democrats have lost so much ground, especially on issues like the tariffs and the steel tariffs, which are really putting them on the wrong side of where the unions are? So uh, you know, Donald Trump ran as a great friend of workers. And I think uh -huh. unfortunately in many ways he has uh, you know, helped business far more than he's helped work. You know, he's you know, scrapped a rule that would have extended overtime pay to five million more workers. He's scrapped the so-called fiduciary rule that required Wall Street firms to act in the best interests of workers in handling their 401ks. His administration has reduced safety uh, safety inspections of, of factories and mines. But he has, you know, the area where he really has battled is, is on trade, and I think a lot of workers like that. I submit, though, that, you know, his trade, he's, he, he's run his trade battles very poorly. And, you know, if you're going to have a big fight with China, you want Canada, you want Europe, you want uh, Japan behind us, but he has so alienated our allies that he's created this one on one fight with China, which I think has made it much harder for America to win, has made it much harder for America's farmers and, and workers and, and consumers. And I think they're, they've been hurt more than in many ways by this fight than we would have been hurt if we did it in a smart way with our allies. And the Democrats are trying to say that. And they, they do realize that China has cheated on trade. And, and you know, some of them sympathize, like Tim Ryan of, of, of Youngstown sympathized with what Trump is doing on trade. But I think you know, some Democrats are saying, the problem is Trump is, you know, gumming up, messing up the way we are fighting on trade. Mm. I mean, I don't know if you watched this clip was getting passed around yesterday of um, Bernie Sanders talking about the rise of China and normalizing of relations with trade relations with China back in 2000, warning that this was going to undermine the two-party system and what a disaster it was going to be for workers. Of course, that turned out to be incredibly prophetic and, in fact, was a big part of the rise of Donald Trump, who in a lot of ways was essentially a third-party candidate who came in and took over the Republican Party. Crystal, you're right again. So, you know, I covered uh, the passage of, of NAFTA, you know, the, the approval of NAFTA, you know, which was negotiated by George H.W. Uh, Bush, but then uh, approved with, with Clinton as president. And Clinton pushed for that. He also approved, you know, pushed for permanent normalized trade relations with China, which also hurt American workers. And I think that has really stained, scarred the Democratic Party. And again, you know, Donald Trump came in as the scourge on trade. He adopted a position that was really very different from the traditional Republican um, position on, on trade. You know, one thing is, you know, so I, was, I covered labor and workplace matters for the New York Times for 19 years. Every two years, I go to Wisconsin and Michigan, Ohio, and write about labor and, and politics. This year, I see is very different because, you know, I've never seen a Democratic candidate talk so, so, so much about labor and wanting to help labor. I think part of that is they, you know, with 24 candidates or however many in the race, everyone's trying to get an age and they get an edge and they realize that one way to do that would be to try to do labor. But I think a second thing is they see that, hey, we, the Democratic Party, lost these three traditional union strongholds, uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, and we have to do something to buck up labor, to strengthen labor, to increase the Democrats' chances in those states and in, in the industrial Midwest in 2020 and 2024 and going forward.
So Stephen, piggybacking off of that, I mean, what do you see as the future of the labor movement? Do you see it as being resurgent? You mentioned that it's like highest popularity that it's been in a long time. You've had these unbelievable teachers movements that have really captured people's imaginations and have crossed sort of the uh, political and ideological lines. Are you hopeful that we'll see a resurgence and are we gonna see sort of new, um, a proliferation of new models of organizing? In, in my book, you know, I argue that you know worker power is at its lowest level in in decades since World War II, and that's really hurt the nation. As I said, with more wage stagnation, more income inequality, you know, more more low wage jobs. And I think you know what we saw say with the teachers strikes is that the teachers felt so beaten up year after year with wage freezes as red state legislatures were cutting taxes on the rich and cutting taxes on corporations, and the teachers said. This stinks. We got to do something, and it shows that when workers are really mistreated, you know they're going to band together to unionize to exercise their collective action. And there's this new poll by uh, some professors at MIT showing that you know 50% of non-union, non-managerial workers would vote to join a union tomorrow if they could. The big reason why that's not going to happen is corporate. So I said, corporate America fights so 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 hard. Mm -hmm who stopped workers from unionizing. So, you know, workers are looking for ways to exercise their collective voice, their collective power to improve their conditions. We saw that with the stop and stop uh, strikes yeah. in, in, mm. in huge success. And we saw that with the strikes. And workers are, are coping, are looking for ways to improve their lot, especially yeah. in this age of extreme income inequality. Yeah. Well, Stephen, final question for you. There's a uh, current dust-up between Barstool Sports, and uh, uh, there's a current dust-up around Barstool Sports with the president of the company tweeting that if you work at Barstool, uh, then you, if you DM this person because he tweeted that he would not allow unionization, I think he's broadly joking there, but it does, uh, it does lead to an interesting question about, labor, about filing a labor complaint against him. If you could just break that down quickly for us. Yeah, I mean, what he's that threatening to is. fire people yeah. who are interested in organizing. It's, pretty, it's like it's clear cut and blatant as it gets. I know, I'm smiling because you didn't see my tweet on this yesterday. <laughs> I did, that's we why did, we're actually. asking. That's asking. <laughs> it's very rare, I wrote, that any business executive you know, takes a, meg you know, a megaphone and, and flares his illegal message. You know, under federal law, uh, it's illegal for companies to retaliate or threaten to retaliate against workers for wanting to form a union or for, you know, for talking to a lawyer to help form a union. And, uh, and what, he's, what he wrote in this tweet is really outrageously illegal. Now, maybe some workers will you know, file a complaint and say this violates their rights and then it would you know, have to percolate up through the system and maybe to the, you know, the five-person National Labor Relations Board. That would probably take years. And you know, the National Labor Relations Board under Donald Trump is very pro-business, so they might not really want to punish him. They might find a reason to say, well, you know, he didn't really, he only threatened and he didn't really punish. But, I, you know, to me, that was really egregious, uh, breaking the law, egregious intimidation <laughs> thing. You know, if you, if you talk with a lawyer about a union, you know, we're going to crush you and fire you. I mean, mm -hmm. and to your point, it could not be more blatant and egregious, and yet there is such a culture of, you know, I mean, the, the anti-union culture is so pervasive. The, uh, the penalties for engaging in this kind of behavior are so low and so fleeting and take so many years to develop that it probably doesn't even matter in a case as flagrant <laughs> as this, which is unbelievable. Um, Stephen, Stephen, congratulations so on the book. Us. Yeah, thank you so much. Love talking to you today. Pleasure. Great to talk with you. Have a great day. Next up on Rising, Citizens United is one of the most infamous recent Supreme Court cases, and campaign finance law expert Richard Hassan says it could be getting a sequel of sorts. He's going to explain how. And new reporting by The Hill's Executive Vice President John Solomon analyzes why Jeffrey Epstein was able to commit suicide, how the circumstances mirror another inmate's death 24 years ago. You can read John's reporting on thehill.com. We'll have more Rising right after this.